We're here in an area of Brooklyn called Little Haiti, near Flatbush Avenue, where Creole is part of the language landscape. But more than a form of communication, it's a food, culture, and way of life that goes beyond the island nation of Haiti to southern states like Louisiana. Growing up a black Creole in New Orleans, with this small percentage of African identity as a person of color and being discriminated. So whenever I encounter a rejection of that nature, I have to step forward and make a statement and do something about it. I like to remind people that the way that people think about a language tends to be the way that people think about the people who speak that language. So a lot of the misconceptions about Creole are tied to the people who speak the language, the Haitian people. I personally feel as if like Haitian food isn't, it isn't normalized and it's not a thing yet, but that's why I'm here now. According to a study in the Journal of Language and Social Psychology, as a person becomes a communicatively competent member of a group, that person acquires that group's social identity. We'll look at how Creole culture is defined and promoted by three people, an author, educator, and chef. I wrote this book, Black Creole, by definition, by law, by the 132nd one drop rule. We're not Creole, we're black Creoles, and we're proud of it. Too white to be black, too black to be white. And I'm often called Dr. Maurice Martinez. Now I'm from New Orleans where the French influence comes in and they call that name Martinez. So it's in mayonnaise. So I prefer Martinez, rhyming with jazz, New Orleans. Traditionally, the word Creole was used to define anyone from the colonized to a group from Europe, anyone born in the New World. I'm a baby of the Great Depression, born in 1934. Growing up in the segregated Deep South, on a daily basis, you were confronted with psychological genocide, fronts to your being a person, you see, in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court decision firmly established apartheid in America. It segregated America into two worlds, one white and one persons of color. My father and mother, by example, had a philosophy of survival. My father had a three-word mantra, work wins everything. He was a bricklayer. My mother, uh, back in the 1930s, started her own school with 15 children of color. I couldn't go to Tulane. I could not go to Loyola, although I'm a Catholic. I could not go to LSU because it did not uh, admit persons of color. In New Orleans, you had this group now of light-skinned Creoles who looked white. They formed a third subgroup and misled by a doctrine of assimilation in order to make it to pass, the elders and the fathers in those families would tell their boys, don't you bring no dark-skinned woman in here. Marry light. The choice was to either identify as a Negro or as white, and families were split apart. I had two grandmothers, both of whom, because of the French influence, were named Marie. There was Marie Bousquet on my mother's side. Uh, on my father's side was Marie Colomb. Now, Colomb is French for Columbus. The Colomb family members claim that they are descendants of Christopher Columbus. Uh, I have no joy in that, because Columbus wasn't quite kosher with uh, persons of color, particularly Indians. See, there's the white side of the family, and then there was the colored side. And there was a funeral, and a well-to-do elder who had accumulated wealth died. There was going to be an inheritance. So that at the wake, I'll never forget, I'm sitting there with my grandmother, and a group of white women walked in. And I said, Grandma, who are those white women? She said, shh, that's your cousin. That's your cousin. She said, she a passable. She got a good job. 
Passa Blanc is French for passing for white. He didn't say anything because you made a better living at that. See, in order to get those even average jobs, you had to deny your identity as being black. A lot of them decided they wouldn't leave New Orleans. So there's a mass migration of Creoles who went to California and Los Angeles. There they could get good jobs. There they could make a living wage. And they are still there but their hearts are still back in New Orleans. When you think of New Orleans, you think of food. Now the food industry for many, many years promoted the label Cajun. Now Cajuns are descendants of white Acadians who fled Canada and came down and lived into the Bayou countries. Those are our country cousins. The difference between Cajun cooking and Creole cooking is that Cajuns take a roadkill and lace it with cayenne. We as Creoles and black Creoles, we cook from scratch. And so the seasoning, oh man, all of my relatives were great cooks. I make a gumbo, it takes me six hours to make. When I finish with a plate of red beans, man, every bean sits up in the plate and sings an aria. All of me, why don't you eat all of me? <laughs> So, you know, I'm from New Orleans, I'm from the Big Easy. Brings out the poet in me. See, I'm a protege of Langston Hughes. He was my mentor. I did my first book of poetry, it was called New Orleans Blues. I once knew this black man, real dark skin, smart as he could be. But no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get hired just because of the dark skin he was in. The period of 1950 to 1965, I saw things happening in the streets of New Orleans. I always was interested in photography. I started with a little black box camera. I saved my negatives and pictures, and I came up. I just got a small grant from the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, uh, some selected photographs. I call it from the dirt streets they came. And in here are pictures, photographs of the Treme. I decided then to move from still photography into documentary film, addressing social justice. How come we're different complexions? What am I supposed to see? I produced the first definitive documentary on the Mardi Gras Indians, so-called Black Indians of New Orleans, in uh, 1975. New Orleans has got so many musicians, and everybody's dancing and having a good time because we had these embedded patterns. We knew the songs, you know, it was one, four, five, a blues. It definitely it goes back to West Africa and the Orishas and the sacred rhythms. Every year I go back, I'm invited to go back to the Jazz and Heritage Festival. There's a, a stage called the Heritage Stage where they give interviews to performing artists and musicians. I've been doing it at least 25 years interviewing Mardi Gras Indians, Black Indians of New Orleans. The Jazz Heritage Festival provides an opportunity to hear some of the best musicians in the world, and it affords me the opportunity to connect, to reconnect with old friends. It's a joy to see that the culture is being sustained and kept alive. I have a thing that says, isolation preserves. I foresee the experiences that Black Creoles had to endure vanishing rapidly because opportunity structures have opened up for the younger people. I just retired after spending 51 years in the classroom. I taught high school for eight years in George Washington Carver Senior High in New Orleans. I love teaching. I love doing it. I did 24 years at Hunter College in a program called Training Tomorrow's Teachers and we put 85% of the new teachers were blacks and Puerto Ricans from the same backgrounds as the students. From Hunter, I went down to University of North Carolina, Wilmington, 20 more years. Being a black Creole has made me sensitive to the needs of persons who have been rejected. Simply because of the accidental of birth made me understand that we live not in a democracy in America, but I had to survive a pigmentocracy. So, yes, I think it was a blessing that I grew up a black Creole.
For a long time, Creole was not viewed as a language that was as robust as other languages. I mean, it, it all comes back to how do people who speak the language are viewed. My name is Winnie Lamore, and I am the founder and managing director of the Haitian Creole Language Institute of New York. Hello. Bonsoir. <laughs> there are many types of Creole that exist in the world. Um, I tend to tell people that um, wherever there was colonization, there exists a Creole language. Asian Creole is a French-based Creole, um, and there are different based Creoles all over the world. In Jamaica, they speak an English-based Creole. Um, in Curacao, they speak a Dutch-based Creole. So you have to know, basically the question is, who colonized who? <laughs> and you'll be able to answer that question. I don't know if there's really an answer to what makes Haitian Creole unique beyond the people who speak the language. I mean, many French-based Creoles are mutually intelligible. Like I've been to St. Lucia and I can understand, I would say about like 80% of um, the, the Creole that they speak there. But you know, the people make it unique and wherever people are in a particular space, the culture that they're able to create in that space dictates also what happens with the language. You know, a lot of things brought me to the U.S., but mostly my, my parents brought me to the U.S. <laughs> they came in the second wave, I would say, um, of Haitians that came in the 1980s after the fall of Baby Doc. So my parents actually first left Haiti in 86 and then um, sent for me in 88. Growing up Haitian in the United States was a challenge, to say the least. I mean, I was in the generation of folks who had to live through the, the four H's, you know, the Haitians being one of the groups of people primarily responsible for spreading HIV AIDS. So I had to live through that perception of Haitian, of Haitian identity. Um, but I would say that with the advent of social media and the internet, I've been very lucky to be part of a group of people who now have a way to speak for themselves and not having to wait for others to tell us about us. When the earthquake happened in 2010, um, I was looking for a way to help the same way that many other people in the diaspora were looking for ways to help. And I'm not an engineer or a doctor or, you know, structural, I don't know, whatever. I'm not someone that could help immediately after such a, a devastating um, event like an earthquake. So I said to myself, I should start with where I am. And I'm trained as a linguist. So I decided to start offering people small group lessons in Haitian Creole, especially for those who are going back to Haiti to help in some capacity. And that kind of snowballed into something bigger than I expected. And so in the fall of 2013, I formally founded the Haitian Creole Language Institute of New York, which is a mouthful. And that's because I wanted people to say the words Haitian Creole language. Like I wanted people to associate the word language with Haitian Creole. Um, and so, you know, here we are. I like to remind people that the way that people think about a language tends to be the way that people think about the people who speak that language. So a lot of the misconceptions about Creole are tied to the people who speak the language, the Haitian people, the long history of presenting them in a certain way and creating a particular narrative around Haiti that serves people outside of Haiti, but not the Haitian people. So you'll have, for example, linguistic, linguistic textbooks um, that study Haitian Creole that call it a very simplified broken French um, or like a bastardized form of French. And that's because a lot of the history of Haiti has been tied to how other people have described the Haitian people and that's directly tied to the Haitian Creole language. So for example, you'll find for um, when folks speak only Creole in Haiti, they're viewed, they're often viewed as uneducated, poor, um, unintelligent, and a lot of that is tied to the language as well. It's too simple to be used to teach things like math or science, you know, so uh, the misconceptions list is very long. <laughs> so we expose them to a lot of really Haitian things. And one of my favorite things to share with the diaspora is Haitian proverbs. So this past class, we worked on different Haitian proverbs, and one of my favorite is um, 
And this one is basically comparable to the English proverb, which says um, the grass is always greener on the other side. Haitian Creole has always been taught, um, but not on a large scale. So um, as long as Haitian Creole has been a spoken language, there has been some written form of it. Um, but there hasn't been this long history of a standardized version of the language. So as long as I've been alive, there's been a standardized version. And there's more of a press to teach it now um, for longer periods of time. So you'll have, for example, in Haiti, students now will learn it. Um, for several years before they dive into, you know, French education. But the issue is that there isn't a lot of content at higher educational level levels in Haitian Creole. So even if you wanted to teach it for the entire uh, educational career of a student in Haiti, the content just isn't there yet. There's a revisiting of what it means to be Haitian in a way that's not centered around, okay, how can we survive being Haitian? You know, because our parents had to like survive being Haitian. And my generation has been about like, how, how do I stand in my, my, my life and my truth as a Haitian person? And a lot of people do that by learning Creole. In learning Haitian Creole, it's a revolutionary act. It's a thing to learn a language that was used to free a people. Like it's, an, like it's not just a free of people like 1500 years ago, like literally like 200 years ago, this happened. It's something that's fresh in people's societal memories. We're not just like some little country of people who speak what people think is a broken French. We're actually like vibrant and living and um, resourceful in ways that a lot of people don't understand because they haven't been through what we've been through. So Haitian not culture is alive and well, been alive and well, is going to be alive and well. And learning Haitian Creole is just another step in acknowledging that it's there. What's the saying? The more you, you know, they plant the seed, they thought they were burying us, but they were just planting the seed. And, you know, there's just been sprouting from there ever since. In a review of new studies on foods and identity, sociologist Daniel Miller found that Food products create the images by which we understand who we have been, who we are, and who we might or should be in the future. I feel like seasoning goes into the identity of everything. My name is Jeffrey Morneau, but I'm also known as Chef Jeff. So the thing about Haitian food is that people can't relate to it because the background is French. And a lot of West Indian cultures, the background is like Americanized. So whereas, you know, Jamaicans, they speak a broken English, which is Patois. But for us, we have Creole, which is a dialect of French. So it's like, people can't directly connect to that unless they have somebody who's able to define it for them. My connection to the Haitian Creole background is through my parents. Both of my parents are from Haiti, and so therefore, I'm Haitian. Unfortunately, I've never been to Haiti, but I feel like I've connected with Haitian culture. So my mother and my father, Another influence on me went to be a chef because they're amazing cooks as it is now. And you know, when I was younger, I was always in the kitchen with them, even down to my aunts and uncles. Like almost all the men and women in my family know how to cook. So there's Haitian Creole food, then there's Louisiana Creole food. To me, they both play on spices. They're both very flavorful, but I feel as if like Haitian food is more, it's more conventional to Haitians. However, Louisiana Creole food is more whimsical. There's more liveliness and colorfulness because you know you have the crawfish you have jambalaya you got your red beans and rice like i feel like those things are like you can play with those things in so many different ways in haitian culture where it's like the dishes are very clear cut haitians are probably the only west indian culture that has dishes that are only for them and growing up i definitely remember black rice their version of rice and peas Black rice is like, uh, it's made with dried mushrooms. So that's a, a, a staple Haitian dish. And griot, griot is fried pork. I definitely love to prepare griot. I like to prepare griot because, because it's one of the staple dishes, it's almost like one of those grandma secret things. So I love to make griot just to kind of like, you know, blast them off their shoes. And so, you know, even preparing griot, like my mother tasted it and she's just like, yo, what did you put inside of this? And that's what I like, cause you know, Mothers are brutally honest. Like, so if there was something wrong with it, she'd either taste it and walk away. But like when she stops and she's like, and then she goes back on the piece, I'm like, all right, cool. Nailed it. 
the, the thing that separates the Haitian patty from all other patties is the fact that it's an amazing, flaky, buttery dough. The staple flavors inside of a Haitian patty growing up was you either had fish in it or you had uh, beef inside of it. They didn't have a veggie. They were, chicken is like the most recent one that they had. So about maybe a few years ago, I told myself, hey, why not just make a Haitian patty? And I actually took the staple griot, something that Haitians have been accustomed to since the hands of time, and shredded it and put it inside a Haitian patty. No one has ever done that. They never put two and two together. Regular is boring. Who wants to be, who wants to be regular? So for me, like a griot Haitian patty is it normal to people. I make it normal. I break all the rules. And I've been breaking rules. And I think that's what's brought me so far in my career. And on my personal menu, I have a jambalaya mac and cheese. I have like, I took parts of my mother's Haitian recipe and I took parts of like what jambalaya is known to be and I put the two together. People call themselves chefs every single day and especially with Instagram, put up a bio, you can be a chef, you can be Superman, you can be a doctor. I'm actually classically trained to be a chef. So attending the French Culinary Institute like opened up my eyes to so much. Sitting in a room full of people that say they can cook, that's my claim to fame. However, for me, I don't want to say that culinary school put me where I'm at today, but culinary school definitely refined me. It definitely taught me proper techniques. It taught me proper technologies. And I mean, it taught me how to properly cook. So after graduating from culinary school, I enrolled into your college where I got my bachelor's degree in business administration. The common misconception is that going to a private institution or going to like one of those expensive colleges will catapult you into this career versus going to CUNY. But I'm a product of CUNY and I'm doing great. I'm a firm believer of sticking to your guns. When I have time to speak about entrepreneurship, it's like I'm opening up a Bible. I didn't have a mentor to walk me through the steps. Like, that's why I will always say experience is the best teacher. So if you told me that I would be where I'm at today, I would, I would call you a liar because I, I didn't plan on this. Like, I didn't do any of this to get my name on the map. I genuinely and truly just love to cook. So by doing that, I feel like I've been able to reach plenty of people. Now, being a, a somebody notable in the Haitian community, it, funny enough, that's not something I ever wanted to do. Only because I never, growing up and seeing the, the Haitian food and stuff like that, it was never like, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't something that you would, you would, you would see like in a five-star restaurant. So I never equated the two together. But then I told myself, I was like, hey, but you, you're classically trained. Why can't you take those foods, those flavors, and make it that pretty five-star plate? A long-term goal for me is to definitely have a cookbook. I would love to have a chef jacket line. I definitely would love to have some of my foods in like the frozen food sections in multiple stores. So I kind of want things that just like brings in residual income while I'm not actually really working. <laughs> but you know, it's like, hey, do the job, place the order, put my name on it, boom, let's go. But I, everything will always be authentic to, to Chef Jeff, but I feel as if like my long-term goal is just to become like a household name where it's like Jeff Crocker, Betty Crocker, you know? So I think that's what kind of like drove me into the Haitian community where it's like, you know, this young Haitian guy, now he's a Haitian chef. I never wanted to be known as a Haitian chef, but I feel as if like that's what kind of sets me apart from everybody else now because it's like, there's so many other chefs, like there's Jamaican chefs, there's chefs from Guyanese culture, there's chefs from Trinidadian culture, and there's, of course, there's black chefs. But it's just for me, well, I'm African-American chefs, but for me, it's, it's one of the situations where it's just like, I feel as if like, my Haitian culture is like my, it's like my gun. It's like my, it's like a, it's like my bazooka because no one can compare to that. Cause I personally feel as if like our food is just so different and so unique that like, that's what, that's what sets me apart from every other chef as well. And there's nothing like Haitian Creole food. Now, I don't think anyone has ever spoken about this, but I know people have thought about it. Haitian food is not as relatable. However, it's because, let's just take jerk chicken. There's a Jamaican jerk chicken, there's a Guyanese jerk chicken, there's a Trinidadian jerk chicken. Curry chicken. You have a Jamaican curry, you have a, uh, you have Indian curry. But when you think of griot, there's no Jamaican griot, there's no Guyanese griot, there's no Trinidadian griot. Haitians 
are probably the only West Indian culture that has dishes that are only for them, that there's no duplicates of it, and that is unmatched. That's it. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, you can go to tv.cuny.edu. I'm Magali Laguerre Wilkinson, and we'll see you next time on Shades of Us. Thank you.